Hello everyone, welcome along to this week's Goal Show as we look back at the Olympics. Also a good event on the European Tour for the men, the women and the disability event as well to touch on. And of course, looking ahead to this week, we've got another big week in golf. It's the World Golf Championship to look forward to in Memphis, Tennessee. I'm going to do all that with our regular guest today, six-time European Tour winner, Simon Dyson. Uh, Simon, welcome along. It was a cracking week, wasn't it? The Olympics, we said going into it, the players that do play tend to love it, even if they are not quite sure about it going in. And it seems like it's happened once again. Absolutely. You know, it's like we, like we said last week, it is a great event. And I think it's only going to grow in stature. You know, the chance to win a gold medal every four years. It's something that is pretty much not, un, it's unheard of in golf because you, you, there's always next week or there's always, you know, next year to win a major. Whereas this is every four years. So it makes it even more special. Yeah, it was certainly special for the winner, of course, Sander Schofle winning the gold medal at 18 under par for the USA. It was big for him in a couple of ways, Simon, because it was his first win, actually, for two and a half years, which is crazy to think Sander Schofle has come so close, hasn't he, recently? And it's big for him personally as well, because his father was an aspiring Olympian before he had a car accident for Germany, and his mother grew up in Japan, his grandparents still reside there. So there's a lot of personal ties to the Olympics for him and Japan himself. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of ties there. So just a great win. You know, we've spoken about him a lot on this show. Just a fantastic golfer. It's surprising that it's been that long since he won um, with the quality of his golf. But he thoroughly deserved it. You know, he, he played very, very good, consistent golf throughout the week. And again, it's, it's something that he will... You know, he'll never forget that experience and, you know, maybe he'll get the chance in four years' time to defend that gold medal. Yeah, great up and down on the last from him uh, with a wedge over the water to secure the gold medal. And winning a silver medal was a man that not many would have predicted. It was Sabatini, the 45-year-old, the oldest man in the field, shooting 61 Olympic record in the final round. Uh, he's always suggested or insisted, rather, that he changed his nationality from South Africa to Slovakia. Uh, because that was his wife's nation, he wanted to grow the game. Um, other people have suggested it's for the Olympics. Whatever the reason was, it certainly worked because he got in the field and did brilliantly. It did work, and what a fantastic last round. I've, I've played quite a few times with Rory, actually, and he was he's one of those players that is always capable of doing something like that. You don't see his name up there very often, uh, at the top of the leaderboard, but he's so capable of shooting those 61, 62s. And yeah, I mean, amazing achievement for him, you know, for the Slovakian South African. So, you know, great event. He'll be, he'll be absolutely made up. And of your three picks, Paul Casey did best. He was in a seven man playoff for the bronze medal. I'm not sure many people would have thought that CT Pan was the one who would come out of that with the likes of Casey, Murakawa, Matsuyama and Roy McIlroy, of course, in that seven man playoff as well. So, uh, just a word on CT Pan for doing that. And of course, Paul Casey coming ever so close to what would have been a massive achievement for him as well. It would. It would have been a great achievement for him. And, you know, it's always going to be very difficult. You're going to have to do, in a seven-man playoff, you're going to have to do something quite special. And, you know, you look at the names that were there. Um, if they'd have had it over, say, a four or five hole playoff, it might have been different. But Fair play to CT Pan, you know, getting that bronze medal. A lot of talk over the week about potential changes to the event, despite it being a great success once again. Uh, would you prefer it to be perhaps a match play, people suggested, maybe a team event, men and women mixed together? Yeah, I think you can really have a play around with it. I think you could do, you know, there's a, there's a few options there. I think the team event would be pretty cool. You know, get a few more players involved, and then you could play... Bit like the World Cup, where you play foursomes and four ball. Um, I think that would be pretty cool. Um, you know, because the Olympics, I know it's there's a lot of individual sports, but you're part of something special and you're part of a, a team all around, you know, Team GB, Team USA. So the team event would be good. And then a mixed team event also, you know, would be pretty cool as well. So there's a, there's a lot of ways that can play around with it. But saying that the singles seems to be working you know it's it's exciting to watch and you know Xander's not going to be complaining is he 
<laughs> no, he's taking home the gold medal. Uh, right, we've got a women's event as well on the same course uh, this week. So betting will be available on that later on during the week. Uh, let's just recap on the European Tour event as well, Simon. In fact, we also had the women's tour and, as I say, a disability event over the weekend as well in Northern Ireland. It was the ISPS Handa World Invitational. And it was a man that you know from Leeds, Daniel Gavins, picking up his first tour title. Yeah, I've, I've known Daniel for, for quite a while, to be fair. He's a very good lad. He works with one of my friends who, who has gone to America now, um, Ian Highfield. So he's one of those players that you knew he had it. And it was just a question of just keep plugging away. I actually spoke with Ian yesterday and he was like, that shows you should never give up. Um, yeah, absolutely made up for the lad because, you know, he's had a lot of lows and this is obviously the biggest high he's ever had. So been playing on Challenge Tour and now he's got, you know, playing rights for the rest of the year for the European Tour next year. So absolutely made up for him. Yeah, it's his first European Tour title, and I think it was his first ever top 10, actually, on the European Tour as well. Hold a couple of monster putts on the back nine to post a score, 65, bogey-free, uh, seven shots back going into the final round as well. But it was a case of David Horsey and Jordan Smith, two very experienced players, uh, falling away in the final stages, which was surprising to many. It shocked me, to be fair. You know, especially, well, both of them, the, when they both get the noses in front, they're quite hard to beat. That kind of course, for me, absolutely suited David Horsey to a tee. You know, so when I saw he was 16 under, two shots clear, honestly, I thought it was a formality. And then, you know, you drop a couple of shots and then he'll be disappointed with the bogey at the last par five, you know, get a drive away, put it in position, give yourself a chance of a birdie to win the tournament. And, you know all of a sudden he has to up and down it to get second on his own. So he'll be, he'll be a bit disappointed. He'll see that as a loss more than a well-earned second place, I'm sure. OK, that's a recap then of what happened last week. Let's move on to this week. We're just going to focus in on the World Golf Championship, the FedEx St. Jude Invitational in Memphis, Tennessee. It's another big week, isn't it? The third and final WGC of the season. I think many people remember this being the Bridgestone at Firestone Country Club, but it has switched to TPC Southwind for the last two editions of this event. But it also used to host the FedEx St. Jude Classic here from the late 1980s all the way through to 2018. So there is absolutely loads of course form to go off. And so the format, just to give you the formalities, you've got a field of 66 players this week, Simon, including 48 of the world's top 50. The only two out of the top 50 that aren't here are John Rahm due to COVID and Christian Besweden, who, who played in the Olympics, I believe. So perhaps that's the reason why he's not traveled over um, but with Ron not playing in particular, it means that Dustin Johnson and Colin Marikawa both have a chance to reach the world number one spot. Yeah, great incentive. You know, it, keep, it seems to be changing quite a lot, that world number one, doesn't it? You know, there was times when we had certain players that, you know, were winning a lot more often. So they held that number one spot a lot. And like when DJ won the Masters, we thought he was going to have a period where he just dominated and, and he hasn't. But, so it's kind of chopping and changing, but a great incentive for those two to get back to world number one. Now, with it being reduced to the best players in the world, obviously we're going to have a good winner, but you always really look at the very elite, don't you, in these WGCs? And that's something you've talked about on the show before. With all the points, all the money on offer, it's like another major to these guys. And the top 10, top 20 do seem to come out on top. They really do. They really do. They just step up the games. This is almost what they prepare for, majors and world events. And it seems to be what they gear it. Like the match play is very different because, you know, you could shoot seven under and get beat, you know. So it's that kind of throws up a few other uh, winners rather than the, the very elite. But, uh, yeah, I, I just... Whenever I look at tournaments like this, I just can't see anybody outside of the top 20 winning it, you know, because the, the top 10, top 15 are that good. And like I say, this is what they're gearing themselves up for. To win. It's all about majors and world events for these guys. OK, we'll get to your selection shortly, but let's just have a quick look at the course as well. There's the TPC Southwind in Memphis, Tennessee. It's a, a par 70 over 7,200 
and 33 yards, Simon. And even going back to the regular event, it's one that was always well attended by the top players. They do seem to really like the track. They really do. You know, it, it just seems to draw the draw them in. The, um, from the highlights that we've seen, from the course that we know, you know, it just looks a really nice course. Greens are nice. The pure running at about 11 on the stint, which is pretty quick. Wind can get up. It's quite challenging. I don't know if it's that challenging off the tee, but approach plays is quite important this week, getting it in the right position on the greens. But it does look a really nice course. There's water on eight of the holes. Um, and we never see a ridiculously low score. So that shows how when it gets this quality of players and the scores around 11, 12, 13 under, that shows that it's a tough, demanding course. And in terms of like a profile fit for a player, what were you looking at? I would say, I mean, I think this type of course, approach plays, if you look at the strokes gained from last year, the approach play was quite important. Um, and putting and around the greens, you like we always say, you're not going to hit all the greens. So if you're, and if your short game's good, it kind of breeds confidence that you can kind of attack a few more pins because you know you'll get up and down anyway. So it, it confidence breeds confidence. So I would say approach play, get it in play off the tee, you know, approach play, get it in the right position on the green and then, you know, putting's obviously such an important part of the game. You, you need to hold the putts. OK, maybe focus on the approach play uh, this week then at TPC Southwind. Right. How many selections have you got, Simon? Who's the first? Uh, I've gone for three this week. Uh, my first is definitely one of the favourites, but there's a reason he's one of the favourites. Uh, Brooks Kotka. I'm going to go for him. You know, his last five events, he's had four top sixes. He's in form. You know, the last six year, last six years here, he's had four top threes. So again, clearly likes the place. Won it in 2019 when it was the first world event. Uh, he was second last year. So that's not too bad. The last two years, is it? First and second. Uh, off the tees, first round, round this course, in particular, his strokes gained, his first off the tee. Eighth tee to green and seventh in putting. So, you know, just a lot of boxes tick there for somebody who you feel could do well. And we all know how good he is. You know, he's one of the best players, if not the on his day. So, yeah, big, uh, big, big favourite of mine, Brooks, and yours. As we are, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, Tita Green has been amazing, hasn't he, really, of late? He always seems to be averaging a stroke better than the field, Tita Green, over the last few events. It's just been the putter's been a little bit cold sometimes, but he keeps on contending, was uh, close at the Open, close at the US Open, in particular the majors. And I'm sure he'd be disappointed he didn't win a major this year, having recovered from his injuries. And maybe this is the next best thing. He'll want to finish the season on a high with the playoffs and maybe win a WGC as well. Yeah, it would be the next best thing for him. It would be a, a world event is, you know, it's almost like a mini major because it does have the best players in the world playing in it. And we talk about his putting. Again, putting's very individual. So there's going to be certain surfaces that suit you better than others. You read the putts better. The ball rolls better off your putter. And for this course, he's seventh in strokes gained um, at Southwind. So... Again, that says to me that this type of surface suits the way he puts. So, yeah, if he can get the putter working and just tee to green like he normally does, he'll, he'll be bang up there. Yeah, he seems to either contend at the moment or miss the cut. So hopefully it is the former for Brett Kepka this week. Right, who's the second pick for you? Uh, I'm going to go for DJ, Dustin Johnson. Again, you know, he's, he's won twice round here, 2012, 2018. And again, for his form has been a bit up and down recently. Um, he had a top 10 in the Open, obviously. But again, for round this course, strokes gained off the tee is second. Tee to green is first. Around the green is fourth. And approach play is 10th. You know, so again, there's some good numbers, some good stats there showing that he likes this place. And, you know, you just need to go back to somewhere where you know you've done well to kind of get that spark and, you know, rejuvenate, you know, 
your, your game, basically. And this could be the place to do it for DJ. Yeah, he hasn't won since the Saudi International, has he, early on this year on the European Tour? And he's not won on the PJ Tour uh, since the Masters last year when he looked like he would never lose again. It was a completely dominant performance, of course, at Augusta. I think he said his play with the wedges, which he's improved so much over the years, has just gone off a little bit. So if he gets that going again, watch out. Yeah, and I'm sure that's what he's been working on with his coach. I'm sure it will be getting those numbers dialed in. You know, so he's got the confidence to leave him the certain numbers that, you know, he, he's going to up and down. So, yeah, I think DJ, it could be one of those weeks where, you know, it might be like Brooks. You know, you might see him miss the cut, but you might see him banging contention as well. OK, two uh, very popular picks, I'm sure, this week. Who's the third? Uh, I've gone for Billy Horschel. Again, I've, we've spoken about Billy a bit. I like I like his work ethic. I like how he goes about his his job. He's had five top tens in the last seven years here. Again, um, off the tee strokes gained his eleventh. Um, and for everything else, he's kind of around twentieth mark. So he's he's in the plus. He's gaining on the field, but he's not absolutely setting the world alight. If you know what I mean, but. He's the type of player, we know he loves a world event. You know, you told me the stats, he's he finished first and second in the last two world events of this year. So he likes a world event. And again, these guys just seem to elevate the games for these tournaments. So, uh, but like I said, I really like Billy Horshaw. I like watching him play, how he goes about his job. And um, he could feature this week. Yeah, he's already a WG sinner, TC winner in the match play. It wasn't he earlier this year, and he was second in the workday in Florida at the concession club as well. So hopefully there's another a good week in a WGC. And uh, I just wonder about the playoffs and the, the Ryder Cup coming up as well, because if you remember back to 2014, when, he couple of, when a couple of playoff events won the FedEx playoffs, won the Tour Championship, just missed out on the Ryder Cup. He still never played in it. I wonder if that's just in the back of his mind. Can I have another big run and maybe get on that team? Absolutely. And why not? You know, it's been done before. He's done it before. Why can't he do it again? You know, like you say, he won a couple of those playoff events. Who's to say he's not going to win this? So he wins a couple of world events. You know, he's, he's a great player, does a lot of things very well. So, yeah, let's see if he features. OK, fingers crossed he'll be a bit bigger price, won't he? So hopefully we can get another one at least into the frame. Uh, right, good stuff. WGC then, FedEx St. Jude Invitational, uh, the, the event we're focusing on this week. Uh, thanks once again, Simon. We've got some big events still to come, haven't we, with the playoffs? And the Ryder Cup is just around the corner. It really starts to get exciting now. Who's going to make that team? It does. You know, the, all the boys around the mark will be thinking about it as well. That'll be in their thoughts, right? Need a couple of good weeks. You know, there's some... Um, like you said, some big events coming up. Um, I just, I can't wait for the Ryder Cup. I absolutely love it. It's the, it's one of the only, well, it's the only tournament I actually, when we play in Europe, I get up for the first tee shot because just soak in the atmosphere. And I've never been to, I've uh, sorry, I've been to Medina, but I've never been to one in Europe. I'd love to go in a couple of years, but it's just a fantastic event. It really is. Any early thoughts on who's going to win it? The USA are the favourites. They've got an amazing team, of course. You saw that at the Olympics, the amount of players they could pick from the top 10 in the world. And, of course, it's on home soil. But Podrick Harrington was saying that of all the American tracks, Whistling Straits is one that maybe can suit the Europeans if it gets windy, of course. I'll be honest, I agree with Podrick because I've played there a couple of times and I love the place, you know, as far as... Um, from playing in Europe to going over there. I absolutely loved it. And it would suit a lot of the European players. It really would. But they are so strong on paper, the Americans. And have, the crowds will be back. American crowds will be very intimidating to play in front of. So I don't know. It's I think it's one you'd have to kind of look into a little bit more deeply. But um, at the That's minute, a nice thing. At the minute, I would say the the Americans are just, yeah, favourites. OK, we'll see how that team harmony, especially the likes of uh, Kutka and DeChambeau, maybe plays itself out over the week. Maybe we can exploit uh, some of that once again, as we always seem to do. I uh, can't wait for that. That's uh, still to come uh, in the distance. For now, let's focus on the WGC and the best select wheel selections. If I could give you just one bet this week out of the three, who would it be? It's got to be Brooks, hasn't it? It's got to be your man. 
books. <laughs> I'll be backing him again. Yeah, he absolutely loves this track, doesn't he? So I think he's yeah. probably hurting a little bit. He hasn't won a major this season as well. So hopefully he's fully motivated for this week. Uh, right. Thanks once again, Simon. Uh, best of luck with your selections. Thanks everybody to watching as well. Cracking event. Uh, with the World Gold Championship, the FedEx St. Jude Invitational to come. It gets underway on Thursday, so get to betfred.com for all the latest odds and offers, and we'll be back next week to review all the action. Mm -hmm.